thought that I may be the last living man on earth. I have been hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. All that happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures in the world now seem part of another life. A life that has no continuity with the present. Furtive the existence of the lonely derelict who pencils these words on the back of some astronomical notes bearing the signature of Richard Pearson. I look down at my blackened hands, my torn shoes, my tattered clothes, and I try to connect them with a professor who lives at Princeton, and who in the night of October 30, glimpsed through his tele telescope an orange splash of light on a distant planet. My wife, my colleagues, my students, my book, my observatory, my, my world. Where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I Richard Pearson? What day is it? Do days exist without calendars? Does time pass when there are no human hands left to wind the clocks? I keep watch at the window. From time to time I catch sight of a Martian above the black smoke. The smoke still holds the house in its black coil. But at length there is a hissing sound, and suddenly I see a Martian mounted on its machine, spraying the air with a jet of steam, as if to dissipate the smoke. I watch in a corner his huge metal legs nearly brush against the house. Exhausted by terror, I fall asleep. It's morning. Morning. Sun streams in the window, the black cloud of gas is lifted, and the scorched metals to the north look as though a black snowstorm has passed over them. I venture from the house, I make my way to the road, no traffic. Here and there, a wrecked car, a baggage overturned, a blackened skeleton. I push on north. For some reason I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away from them. I keep a careful watch. I have seen the Martians feed. I must keep alive. Two days I wander in a vague northerly direction through a desolate world. Finally, I notice a living creature, a small red squirrel in a beech tree. I stare at him and wonder. He stares back at me. I believe at that moment the animal and I shared the same emotion. The joy of finding another living being. I push on north. I find dead cows in a brackish field. Beyond the charred ruins of a dairy, the silo remains standing guard over the wasteland like a lighthouse deserted by the sea. The next day I came to a city vaguely familiar in its contours, yet its building was strangely dwarfed and blown off, as if a giant hand sliced off its highest towers with a capricious sweep of its hand. I reach the outskirts. I find Newark. Undemolished, but humbled by some whim of the advancing Martians. Presently, with an odd feeling of being watched, I caught sight of something crouching in a doorway. I made a step towards it, and it rose up and became a man. A man armed with a large knife. Stop. What? Keep going. Where did you come from? I come from... <clears throat> Many places. A long time ago from Princeton. Princeton, huh? That's near Grover's Mill. Yes. Grover's Mill. Ha, ha, ha. There's no food here. This is my country. All this end of town, down to the river. There's only food for one. Which way are you going? I don't know. I guess I'm looking for... for people. What was that? Did you hear something just then? Only a bird. A live bird. You get to know that birds have shadows these days. Say, we're in the open here. Let's crawl into this doorway and talk. Have you seen any... Martians? Nah. They've gone over to New York. At night, the sky is alive with their lights, just as if people were still living in it. By daylight, you can't see them. Where were you? You're in a uniform. Yeah, what's left of it. I was in the militia, National Guard. That's good. There wasn't any war any more than there's war between men and ants. And we're eatable ants. I found that out. What will they do to us? I've thought it all out. 
right now we're caught as we're wanted. Hey, um, can you stop for a second? Can we cut um, right after by daylight? You can't see them. Let's cut Pearson's line. Where were you? You're in uniform. Let's cut, cut that. Yep. Let's cut the strangers, that whole line. And cut Pearson just, and we're eatable ants. I found that out. So just start, go from by daylight, you can't see them, straight to what will they do with us. Thank you. So, okay, I'm sorry, just let me get this straight. That's so after, I, after he says you can't see them, then we cut everything else out until I say what will they do with us. Yes. Okay. What will they do with us? <laughs> so like that for him. Okay. <laughs> I've thought it all out. Right now we're caught as we're wanted. The, Mar the Martian only has to go a few miles to get a crowd on the run, but they won't keep doing that. They'll begin catching us systematic-like, keeping the best and storing us in cages and things. And they haven't begun on us yet. Not begun? Not begun. <laughs> All that's happened so far is because we don't have sense enough to keep quiet, bothering them, bothering them with guns and such stuff, and losing our heads, and rushing off in crowds. Now, instead of rushing around blind, we've got to fix ourselves up. Fix ourselves up according to the way things are now. Cities, nations, civilization, progress, done. But if that's so, what is there to live for? Well, there won't be any more concerts for a few million years or so, and no nice little dinners at restaurants. If it's amusement you're after, I guess the game's up. And what is there left? Life, that's what. I want to live, yeah, and so do you. We're not going to be exterminated, and I don't mean to be caught either, and tamed and battened and bred like an ox. What are you going to do? I'm going on, right <laughs> under their feet. I've got a plan. We men as men are finished. We don't know enough. we got to learn plenty before we've got a chance. And we've got to live and keep free while we learn, see? I thought it all out, see? Tell me the rest. Well, it isn't all of us that were made for wild beasts, and that's what it's got to be. That's why I watched you. All these little office workers that used to live in these houses, they'd be no good. They haven't any stuff to them. They just used to run off to work. I've seen hundreds of them running wild to catch their commuter train in the morning for fear they'd get canned if they didn't. Running back at night, afraid they won't be in time for dinner. Lives insured and a little invested in case of accidents. And on Sundays, worried about the hereafter. The Martians will be a godsend for those guys. Nice roomy cages, good food, careful breeding, no worries. After a week or so chasing about the fields on empty stomachs, they'll come and be glad to be caught. You've thought this all out, haven't you? You bet I have, and that isn't all. These Martians will make pets of some of them, train them to do tricks. Who knows? Get sentimental over the pet boy who grew up and had to be killed. And some, maybe, they'll train to hunt us. No, that's impossible. No human being... Yes, they will. There's men who will do it gladly. And if one of them ever comes after me, why, uh... In the meantime, you and I and... Others like us? Where are we to live when the Martians own the Earth? I've got it all figured out. We'll live underground. I've been thinking about the sewers. Under New York are miles and miles of them. The main ones are big enough for anybody. Then there's cellars, vaults, underground storerooms, railway tunnels, subways. You begin to see, eh? And we'll get a bunch of strong men together, no weak ones. That rubbish, out. And you meant me to go. Well, I gave you a chance, didn't I? We won't quarrel about that. Go on. And we've got to make safe places for us to stay in, see, and get all the books we can, science books. That's where men like you come in, see. We'll raid the museums, we'll even spy on the Martians. It may not be so much we have to learn before. Just imagine this. Four or five of their own fighting machines suddenly start off Heat rays right and left, and not a Martian in them. Not a Martian in them, but men. Men who have learned the way how. It may even be in our time. Gee, 
Imagine one having one of them lovely things with its heat ray wide and free. We turn it on Martians. We turn it on men. We bring everybody down to their knees. That's your plan. You and me and a few more of us, we own the world. I see. Say, what's the matter? Where are you going? Not to your world. Goodbye, stranger. After parting with the artillery man, I came at last to the Holland Tunnel. I entered that silent tube, anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously, I came out of the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. I stood alone on Times Square. I caught sight of a lean dog running down Seventh Avenue with a piece of dark brown meat in his jaws and a pack of starving mongrels at his heels. He made a wide circle around me as though he feared I might prove a fresh competitor. I walked up Broadway in the direction of that strange powder. Past silent wooden shop windows displaying their mute wares to empty sidewalks. Past the Capitol Theater, silent, dark. Past a shooting gallery where a row of empty guns faced an arresting line of wooden ducks. Near Columbus Circle, I noticed brand new cars in the showrooms facing the empty streets. From over the top of the General Motors building, I watched a flock of black birds circling the city. I hurried on. Suddenly, I caught sight of the hood of the Martian machine, standing somewhere in Central Park, gleaming in the late afternoon sun. An insane idea. I rushed rec recklessly across Columbus Circle and into the park. I climbed a small hill above the pond at 60th Street. From there I could see, standing in a silent row along the mall, 19 of those great metal titans. Their cows empty, their great steel arms hanging listlessly to their sides. I looked in vain for the monsters that inhabit those marshes. Suddenly, my eyes were attracted to the immense flock of black birds that hovered directly below me. They circled to the ground, and there before my eyes, stark and sound, lay the Martians, with hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh from their dead bodies. Later, when their bodies were examined in the laboratory, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and diseased bacteria against which their systems were unprepared, slain, after all men's defenses had failed, by the humblest thing on this earth. Before the cylinder fell, there was a general persuasion that through all the deep of space no life existed beyond the petty surface of our minute sphere. Now we see further, dim and wonderful is the vision I have conjured up in my mind of life spreading slowly from this little seedbed of the solar system. Throughout the inanimate vastness of the sidereal space, but that is a remote dream. I, it may be that the destruction of the Martians is only a reprieve. To them and not to us is the future ordained perhaps Strange it now seems to sit in my peaceful study at Princeton, writing down this last chapter of the record begun at a deserted farm in Rover's Mill. Strange to see from my window the university spires dim and blue through an April haze. Strange to watch children playing in the streets. Strange to see young people strolling on the green, where the new spring grass heals the last black scars of bruised earth. Strange to watch the sightseers enter the museum where Dissembled parts of a Martian machine are kept in public view. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it. Bright, clean cut, hard, and silent under the dawn of that last great day. significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheep, jumping out of a bush and saying boo. <clears throat> Starting now, we could soak all your windows and steal all your garden gates by tomorrow night, so we did the next best thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed CBS. You will be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it, and that both 
institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody. And remember that terrible lesson you learned tonight. That gritty, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch. And if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, there was no Martian. It's Halloween. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations coast to coast have brought you The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, the 17th in its weekly series of dramatic broadcasts featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the air. Next week, we present a dramatization of the three famous short stories. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Nice, 44 minutes. Well, sure exactly where to break. Yeah, yeah it, me, it, it may not be every sentence. It may be some to hear. And it'll help some as, I, as I decide who I'm talking to. As yeah. well. like, I'm talking but, it, to but I like the dynamic. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, there in the end, I think I'm just sort of unambiguously shouting. You're just shouting. <laughs> <laughs> Holy fuck! Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, going to kill me. Let's not fall into the John Goodman when he's lazy school of acting. Just yell it. Don't you agree when he gets lazy, he just No, no, I, I'm with you. As a matter of fact, that was the entire last two seasons of Roseanne. Shut the fuck up, Sonny. It's like... God damn it, son! He just gave up. Dude, you used to be funny. He could, he could act, he could subtle, he could do all kinds of things. It's like, man, he started you upstage. Oh, that's right. Uh, I get it. Go ahead. Shout out, brother. Go ahead. <laughs> Just let the pissed off fat woman run the show. <laughs> okay. Um, page eight. Dave, I like your commander voice. Okay. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah, he is. Is he actually inside a plane flying? Yes. He's, I think he is. Basically, I a think so too. Plane. I was just wondering about that. How we're getting Like, in. should we do like airplane noise? I've, I've got a note. Cut. Unless this cut to sound of airplane motor. So, in the line before it, you hear the airplane. Yeah, I'll take care of it. Don't you worry your pretty little head. But Dave, remember to build at the end because this is your you're in the plane, your adrenaline's pumping. Yeah. And I was trying to do that. Was, was probably well, I mean there 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 are techniques, ways to build. You can you can simply build by being actually just becoming louder. So you can over the you can keep your same voice uh, at First 800 yards, then build 600, 400, 200, you know what I mean? You could just, right. it's a build. Uh, and then when you see them, if you, if, how excited you'd be, you're getting ready to kill the Martians and save the world. I could hear a little bit of that excitement in your voice, maybe? Something? Don't get bone. Cockiness. Don't get bone here, Dave. Okay. You should be writing these notes now. I, I've already written these. <laughs> I was trying to throw bones over. And okay. You're not the one who's I just mm -hmm. tossed the bone. You're just doing great. You're doing great. Page nine. We'll say niner. Niner. On uh, Pearson, uh, we'll, we'll we'll work on this tomorrow. Uh, yes. I, I liked there was more dynamics. Um, I really liked some of the. You did some subtle things that I really liked. Um, and we're gonna and, and your future active the. the you, you made love to that word in your mouth, and it was so beautiful. It was perfect. So that's good. All right, but anyway, that was getting ahead. Uh, page, uh, yeah, Dave. Du -du -du -du. Stranger. Tell me what my note is. Pick a dialect. That's one of my notes. <laughs> Tell me what my other note is. I don't know. Give you a hint. No, no, no directing from the peanut gallery. Um, just remember that you're psychotic and scared, and you haven't seen another human in a while. And so when you tell him to stop, you need to really stop it with your voice. Command him to stop. There's no way he could not stop. He's a little pencil neck professor, science geek, and you need him for your plan. So you have to stop right where he is and help him for your plan. Right? Okay. So, uh, yes, and pick a dialect, please. Please have one picked very soon so we can start working on it and make it right. Don't make me assign you one. Um, let's see. Then Dave, page 10. Remember to finish 
know what you're going to say at the end of that why at the bottom of the page. If one of them ever comes after me, why? Yeah. Go ahead and write out what the end of that sentence is. Why I oughta. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just let Pearson cut you off. So keep talking until he completely cuts you off. Da, da, da. The rest of my notes are more for when we're up and moving. That's it. No. Any uh, observations, questions, notes, additions, subtractions, multiplications, motions? I noticed something. I don't know if it will help or not. Maybe. One paragraph. Oh, I do have something else. I'm sorry. I cut a bunch more out of your speech. Or, I feel like it's been kind of. Sorry. There's one paragraph that one announcer says mm -hmm. that is the most important paragraph in the entire show. Which the one? Entire show. It's announcer on page six. Page six. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who land in the Kill us all. Everybody you know, everybody you think, they're all dead now. I was just sitting there listening to this. Like, <laughs> the words are pretty intense. Do you have any idea how fucking epic this thing is? This is this is President Obama telling the nation right now that die. they have no nation. This is the president saying, guys, we are fucked. <laughs> when well, you told me to hold the professionalism of the announcer as a journalist throughout that whole part. You know, and, and we, we can bat that around. Um, yeah, the journalist would be moved by so, this. But, but there care. is something. That this, is, this, is what, this is what I was thinking about today when, when we were doing I was thinking yeah. about this is like some, band some. playing on while the Titanic is going on. Yeah. That's exactly what this announcer is. Now, did they cry? While they were playing, they continued to play no matter what. You know what I mean? So you're moving, you're, you're going to continue doing it to the end. You're a trooper, as professional as you can be. But, but this, this 